Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation. I'm Li Yuan Yang, the Assistant Director of Alumni Engagement at Thomas Edison State University. I serve as co-chair of the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Council. We work with a group of highly talented and dedicated colleagues. The council was charged by the president, Dr. Hancock, to generate dialogue and engagement regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion across and among the members of Thomas Edison and New Jersey State Library community. The council develops recommendations for training, policies, and practices that foster a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive culture for the Thomas Edison and New Jersey State Library community promotes educational and personal development programs to further the mission of the council, promotes the use of assessment to evaluate and monitor DEI needs, and makes recommendations for changes that promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. To learn more about our work, please visit the DEIC page on the Capital Campus portal. I'm now pleased to have Dr. Tara Kent introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Mei Wen. I'm Tara Kent, an Associate Dean and member of the Council. I'm happy to introduce our speakers for today's presentation. Dr. Diana Sanchez is a Thomas Edison mentor and subject matter expert in psychology. She serves as a full professor of psychology at Rutgers University and holds the PhD in social psychology and women's studies from the University of Michigan. She is a diversity science scholar whose research expertise covers stigma identity, intergroup bias, and close relationships. She has over 100 publications on these topics and numerous awards, including the recent honor of being selected as the inaugural 2021 recipient of the Society of Experimental Social Psychology's Diversity Science Mid-Career Award. Dr. Sanchez has over 15 years of experience participating in and leading DEI initiatives at Rutgers University and in the broader scientific community. Her DEI service has been recognized with the Faculty Leader in Diversity Award from Rutgers and the Distinguished Service Award from the Society of Personality and Social Psychology. Dr. Julie Garcia is a professor and the Associate Chair in the Psychology and Child Development Department at California Polytechnic State University. She earned the PhD in social psychology from the University of Michigan and was a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University. She has been researching and teaching on topics related to DEI for over 20 years. Her research areas of expertise include stereotyping, prejudice, stigma, intergroup relations, social identity, and underrepresentation in STEM. This work has been funded by prestigious grant agencies, including the National Science Foundation and the Russell Sage Foundation. Her research contributions have been acknowledged with awards at both Cal Poly and at the national level. She's given implicit bias talks and workshops in academic business and health settings, and also has a TEDx SLO talk on this topic. She has led award-winning diversity initiatives for two divisions of the American Psychological Association and led DEI efforts at Cal Poly in her role as interim associate vice president for diversity and inclusion. We're all very grateful to Dr. Sanchez and Dr. Garcia for sharing their time and expertise with us. After their presentation, participants may submit questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sanchez and Dr. Garcia. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Thank you for that warm welcome. We really appreciate it. Yes. Um, so today we're very excited to be here. And this is a particularly wonderful experience for me to be able to be with my colleague over in California, Julie Garcia, to talk to you about implicit biases and microaggressions, what they are and what we can do about them. So we're gonna start off with Julie giving us some guidelines and then we'll give you an overview and then we'll jump into our content today. Thank you, Diana. <clears throat> so we just wanted to first um, discuss the scope and parameters of our presentation today. Um, I know we're over Zoom and we can't see your faces, um, 
but we want to invite you to please uh, stay engaged mentally, emotionally, physically. We're only here together for an hour. Um, and uh, we'll be speaking our own truth in this conversation. We, we will be sharing data and research related to bias. What does our social science say about um, why we act in biased ways and ways to engage in more equitable practices. Um, but we'll also share some anecdotes of part of our lived experiences as, as to, to accentuate some of those theories and research. We also want to remind you to understand the difference between intent and impact. Often with some of the examples uh, we might share with you, often people don't intend to act in a biased way, but that doesn't mean that sometimes um, our actions don't impact people uh, in a negative way. Um, so we'll showcase some of those ways in which some of our actions, although maybe not ill-intended, can still have a negative impact. Um, and, and really the, the goal is to share with you the, the research and some practical strategies at the end. So with that, go ahead, Diana, to the next slide. So we're gonna talk about what is implicit bias and hopefully some of you are able to take one of the measures of implicit bias, the IAT before this, but if not, don't worry, we will give you a sense of what that looks like. Then we're going to talk about how these implicit biases may affect and other biases might affect our interactions with others. And then finally, we're gonna close with what we can do to change them. And before we start talking about um, biases, we have to start that conversation first by talking about or defining what social identities are, um, the ways in which we categorize others and the identities that people possess that may be the source of bias in the world. So um, first, the social identity is the part of our self-context, self-concept that's derived from our membership in groups. And as you can see from this big pinwheel here, there are many, many different identities that we might have. Right. So we can have an identity as, for example, as a woman, um, which I identify as with the pronouns she, her. Um, I can have I have a race and ethnicity identity. So I identify as a Czech Rican, a Czechoslovakian, Puerto Rican. And we can have a number of other identities, such as around our age, our education, um, our religious backgrounds. And these different kinds of identities convey different meanings in the world. Some of those identities are privileged. Some of them are valued in society. Some of them are devalued and some of them are marginalized by others, the source of uh, stereotyping and biases. And some of those identities that we have are, are not easily seen. They're hidden. They're underneath the surface like this image shows you here. So some of those identities that can be valued or devalued are concealable, things you might not know about a person. That could be their generational status. That could be their political beliefs. That could be their sexual orientation. And people have in the world different attitudes about these identities, whether they're hidden or conspicuous identities that may be positive or negative in nature. So Julie's going to tell us about a little bit more about that. So our biases can operate at what we call an explicit or implicit level. And I'll talk more about what those two different types of biases um, mean. So explicit means it's operating at a conscious level, something we're readily aware of. If we're at, it sometimes operates in terms of deliberate decisions we might make, like hiring decisions or even things like choosing a friend. And the way we tend to operationalize it or measure that in our field is by things like self-reports. So asking people how much they agree or disagree uh, with certain beliefs about certain people for that, from certain backgrounds or groups. So that's something we're consciously aware of. But sometimes our biases operate at what's called an implicit level. Some, sometimes our biases um, or un unconsciously aware of them, um, they often maybe manifest in snap decisions. Um, and how we tend to measure that uh, one way we measure that is with the implicit associations test or the IAT. <clears throat> so if you did an IAT, we asked um, to, to share with you the, I, the implicit associations test so you could take one if you, if you wish. We're not gonna ask you to share your results. Um, we wanted to, you to get the feel for what um, measuring your implicit bias feels like. So you might see something like this screen where you have an image of, um, in this case, they're measuring race. They might see images of black and white faces. And then you're asked to quickly categorize them in one of two, in two different buckets at the same time, either uh, African-American good or European-American or bad. So in addition to faces, they'll also be maybe presenting words that are have valence of good or bad word, word meanings on there. 
Um, and how quickly you, you put those into different buckets is a measure of your implicit associations or your implicit biases. Because the premise is, is you're putting these in buckets so quickly that you can't uh, correct for them. So it shows a, an implicit belief. So a fast reaction time is means that you're quickly associate them. So if you're quickly to associate a black, black face with African-American good, then that means you have a positive association with African-Americans. And if you're slow to categorize African-American uh, with good, for example, that means that you have uh, don't have that association. So it's quicker for you to, to categorize that in that way. So this test has been around for quite some time. Um, since 1998, over 15 million people have participated. And we this, show, this test shows that biases exist in over 75% of people and that um, we tend to, the, the result tends to show that we favor men, white people, youth, heterosexuals, and physically able people. So where do these come from? We're gonna share with you a video that um, dives deeper into where these associations come from. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. 2016 was the year that implicit bias went somewhat mainstream. Yeah, so when Hillary Clinton mentioned implicit bias in the debates, our phones started blowing up, all our friends started emailing us about it. But what is implicit bias? Implicit biases are basically thought processes that happen without you even knowing it. Little mental shortcuts that hold judgments you might not agree with. And sometimes the shortcuts are based on race. First, some clarity. Saying someone has an implicit bias is different from calling someone a racist. The word racist is a highly loaded term, right, here in American society. A lot of times when people are using it, they're thinking of the kind of old-fashioned Ku Klux Klan style racist. But implicit bias isn't anywhere near that, you know, explicit. Implicit bias is something that comes out of ordinary mental functioning, out of how the mind normally works. We've all grown up in a culture with media images, news images, conversations we heard at home, our education. Think of that as a fog we've been breathing our whole life. We would never even realized it, what we were taking in. And that fog causes associations that lead to biases. I somehow know that if you say peanut butter, I'm going to say jelly. That's an association that's been ingrained in me because throughout my life, peanut butter and jelly are together. And in many forms of media, there is an over-representation of black men and violent crime being paired together. And because of that, I actually deep down inside have been taught that black men are violent and aggressive and not to be trusted, that they're criminals, that they're thugs. With all those associations, I'm not trying to let us off the hook, but in some ways, none of us stood a chance. Starting today, we'll post a video a day dealing with one challenge of understanding implicit bias and its relationship to race and exploring ways we might combat the problem. One more thing, if you're seeing this and thinking that it doesn't apply to you, well, you might be falling prey to the blind spot bias. That's the scientific name for a mental bias that allows you to see biases in others, but not in yourself. We're biased. Implicit bias. So just to reiterate some of the things that you heard in this video, our implicit biases come from many sources, which means that we're inundated with them on a regular basis. It can come from the films we watch. It comes from our culture, for example. So, you know, we, the example they use was peanut butter and jelly, but that's a very American example. Not everyone has that association between peanut butter and jelly. And that means that some of the stereotypes and implicit beliefs that people have will vary from different cultural contexts to different cultural contexts. In addition, we consume images regularly through advertisements. Um, and we also, our biases come from our interactions. And that can be our, inter our in-person interactions or even our online interactions with social media. In addition, our, the television, uh, Netflix, anything you're streaming, that kind of content also has, um, might be a source of our biases. For example, you might be, look at what shows you watch and be critical of how diverse those images are. We often are drawn to content without thinking about it that represents people who look like us, right? Which means we're not getting exposed to other types of groups. And of course the news and uh, the very poignant example of African-American men being associated with crime is constantly being fed to us via various news sources. 
And these all contribute to our um, implicit biases. And so these biases can affect our interactions and our perceptions. And Julie is going to take us through an example here to kick us off. Great. So for a second, if, if you have a piece of paper in front of you, I'd like you to take out a sheet of paper and a writing instrument to go ahead and find something. You're just going to have to write something down during this video. You can also capture it in your head, um, but a writing instrument might just help you tally, if you, if you will. So what we're going to show you is an awareness test. So it's, it's a, the instructions will be provided in the video, but what you're going to see is two sets of, of people, um, some in white shirts, some in black shirts, and you're going to count the number of uh, passes the team in white makes. Okay. okay. Are you all, all ready? Right. I can't tell. There's no hand gestures or nodding, <laughs> um, but <laughs> it's okay if you don't use the paper, you don't have to, but just count and you should be there. All right, here we go. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? This is the same video, just rewind. He didn't catch it. No! Thank you, Diana. So why did we show that video? We wanted to show you an example of how our biases or stereotypes can act as a filter or, or that we just see certain things. The moonwalking bear is pretty, you know, outlandish. And probably many of you didn't see that on the first glean of that. Because I you're definitely just didn't. For <laughs> <laughs> we did this exercise when we were practicing for this and I absolutely missed that. And I can't believe it because I used to know that that was an exercise back in the day. So, yeah. <laughs> so many of you may have, uh, have, have missed that too. And it, it's really outlandish, right? This, this moonwalking bear in the middle of, of the scene. And it's the same video that you see um, just for round. So our biases can act as a filter that way. And that sometimes we just see what we want to see because we want to be right. Um, we want our, our stereotypes or expectations to be confirmed. And oftentimes this operates not at a very conscious level. I'm not thinking I want to be right. I'm going to see what I want to see. It's just, you know, how we're, you know, you know how, how we are, how our brains operate. So we seek, interpret, and create information that verifies our existing beliefs. So this um, is just a cartoon that kind of, you know, showcases that, that uh, we might have one single supporting fact and we might be presented with overwhelming proof, but that sometimes isn't enough to offset that single supporting evidence. So an example of this might be, let's say you have a, a belief or stereotype that all gay men are effeminate. Then you might be walking around uh, in your world and, and see people who you categorize quickly, like, oh, that person, that man seems to be very effeminate, that he must be gay. But you might be encountering lots of masculine gay men, but you never code them as gay. So you keep your constrained viewpoint of this is how this group is all like, because you just see and code information that's consistent with your expectations. Right. So Diana's so, gonna share with you some, go ahead, Diana. <laughs> Thanks. So um, there is a lot of scientific evidence, not just anecdotal, um, that has demonstrated this confirmation bias. Um, I'm gonna give you one example here in the educational context, because I think it's pretty powerful, um, but we could share others with you if, if you're interested in that. But essentially a group of researchers at Yale University was interested in examining, examining confirmation biases in preschool teachers. Um, and so their basic question was, is there a bias in how teachers detect challenging classroom behavior? And so what they did was they brought in black and white uh, teachers and they had them watch videos of four children, a black boy and girl and a white boy and girl. And then the teachers were told to press a button when they saw a challenging behavior. And in reality, importantly, there actually was no challenging behavior, but they were supposed to be vigilant for that and expecting to see that. And at the same time, they were able to measure via eye tracking study um, 
where the, the teachers were looking on the screen when they were observing these videos, right? And what they found was, is that of, for both the black and white teachers who were told to, to look out for challenging behavior, when they looked at their eye gaze and where they spent their time, they uh, majority were spending more time looking at the black boy in this particular preschool context uh, than any of the other children. In addition, when they were asked explicitly which child required the most attention, again, they, uh, the majority felt as though the black boy needed the most attention compared to the other groups. So um, teachers are showing this uh, bias towards only or primarily observing the black boy in the video because they think or expect him uh, to show this challenging behavior. And if you look for something in one place, that's the only place that you'll find it. And this is just one of the confirmation biases. Another type is self-fulfilling prophecies that Diana will, will explain. So self-fulfilling prophecies are um, the expectations we have about a person that lead that person to behave in ways that actually confirm those expectations. So if I expect a challenging behavior, I may act in a way such as observing, uh, this particular person more, which might make that person behave in a negative manner because they're getting all this um, like negative attention potentially. And that is sort of the definition of a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy where you have these expectations that lead to confirmation of that behavior. And then, so this is showing the three-step process. This is showing somewhat in jargony terms, but in a social psych perspective. So perceiver is this person that's observing someone else and the target is the person who's being observed. So you have some type of expectation, maybe based on stereotype or reputation. And that expectation sh uh, shapes how we behave towards that other person. And then that person in response to our behaviors acts often in lines that uh, confirm those expectations. So our expectations shape our behaviors which shape the other person's behaviors often in ways that are confirm our initial expectations. So we're gonna share with you a concrete example of that based on research. So there was a research done in the 60s um, where teachers were told based on an IQ test, half of their students were on the brink of an intellectual spurt. In actuality, students were randomly assigned to conditions. There was no IQ test. So there's randomly assigned, here's a high achieving, low achieving group. And then they tested those students eight months later on an actual IQ test and found that those who were expected to be smarter actually performed better. So what happened in those eight months? Well, likely a self-fulfilling prophecy occurred. Those teachers were the perceivers in this case. They had certain expectations of their students, the target in this case. The teachers thought, well, I have high achieving, high IQ students. And that's gonna shape how they behave. Maybe give them a call on this, those high IQ students more, give them more praise, more positive feedback. And how do you feel when you're praised? You're more confident, um, they engage more, and that in turn um, affects your performance. You perform better. And you can see the, the converse of that too, right? So if a, if a teacher has low expectations, probably not calling on that student as much, um, not getting encouraging as much, student doesn't feel um, very confident and then performs worse. So mm -hmm. those expectations, they created that reality mm -hmm. by how by how they treated others. Mm -hmm. So our biases affect our interactions. They do so through, for example, some of the examples that uh, Julie just outlined and also our nonverbal behaviors. So if we have an expectation about someone that they might act in uh, a certain negative manner, we might shift our body cues. So when we're having positive expectations and engaged, we lean forward, we look at someone um, in the eyes, we, we face them with our shoulder position. We do a lot of head nods, like I am for Julie during this talk, a lot of <laughs> smiles, right? Um, Thanks, but if I have these negative um, expectations and I don't do those things, I might look away during an interaction. I might lean back. I might not have my shoulders facing this person. I might not give them direct eye contact. And that's going to shape how they act towards me, right? It's going to shape um, their response to me. And that can confirm some of my expectations from the start. Um, in addition, our implicit biases might affect um, our engagement in things like microaggressions. And this refers to brief everyday exchanges that send denigrating messages to certain individuals because of their group membership. And 
this can be a variety of things. One of the one I'm a researcher in the domain of uh, multiracial identity. People who have multiple identities have parents of a different racial background. And so one of the microaggressions they mention in a lot of the research that I've done is the question of what are you right. Um, when people ask this and it's usually not relevant to anything that's happening in the interaction um, and it uh, it is a real focus on someone's appearance. It can get send the message that you're not um, that you feel excluded from some racial groups. In addition, another example would be uh, for the Latinx and Asian American community. They are often um, experiencing like eighty percent of Asian Americans experience the uh, instance of someone asking them where they're from, like where they're really from, um, in, which sends the message that this person they're assuming that this person, because they're not white, um, that they're Asian American, is that that they're not American. Um, so that's the assumption that can be behind some of these um, microaggressions or stereotypes about groups. And of course, if you're an Asian American and people assume that you're um, not American and ask you these questions, it can be pretty painful. And my work shows that those kinds of encounters tend to lead to long-term health issues, um, stress, uh, feelings of a lack of belonging. Um, so I'm going to show you a brief clip to give you some other examples of this as well. Okay. For people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well-spoken. Oh. Just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> Mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while... No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date... Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. <gasps> I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Can you shopping so bad I love Cher too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every day. Can I touch your hair? Multiple times a day. So pretty. Can, I Can I touch, touch your it? Hair? Please. Can I please? Can I please? It's annoying. That makes you want to go ballistic on those mosquitoes. Which seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black woman. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm, maybe you should try this challenging major. Ow, oh, my dreams. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like he was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, Stop. some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggression. For people who... Thank you, Diana. So I, I think what that clip nicely shows is that microaggressions are often, often uh, we don't intend to maybe um, act in a biased way, um, but it doesn't mean that it has a negative impact. And we can see that it happens with maybe um, mundane interactions, um, walking down the street, but it has also consequential interactions such as providing opportunities um, for career opportunities or actually, you know, affecting someone's life um, based on our, our biases and how we engage with others. Um, so a range of, of biases. So we, we've kind of set the stage for what does our science show about why biases might manifest? What are the consequences for our biases? And we wanna end with some practical strategies. What can you do if you wanna engage in more egalitarian behaviors? Um, so you might've heard about uh, anti-racism um, framework. Although um, this phrase is, um, Re refers to racial relations, I think can be broader than that. And really the premise behind this is if we want to engage in egalitarian behaviors, it's a, it's a perpetual choice of again and again to engage in, a, in a, an egalitarian equitable way towards others. Um, so I think it's a nice framework for how we might choose to engage with others. It's not just one moment of time, but how we perpetually behave. Um, one knee-jerk reaction sometimes when we present this work is, 
Uh, well, if if difference, as Diana started this talk with social identities, we all have different social identities. And if difference is really at the heart of why biases uh, manifest, then one might say, well, how about I just don't notice difference? I have a color blindness, color aversion uh, approach. And what our science tends to show is, is A, we're not very good at doing that. Uh, it's not a strategy that's very effective. Um, often we try to suppress something, it comes up more often in our head. Um, uh, and also more, moreover, people often want to be seen in their entire person. They want to be seen and appreciated for um, the diverse um, backgrounds that, that they bring to the table. So rather than not seeing it, how do we appreciate and embrace um, people's different perspectives, uh, different backgrounds? One other way to engage more equitable um, behaviors is seeing the whole person. Um, as Diana shared with some of her identities earlier, her, her race and gender, I've known Diana for over 20 years and I see Diana as a, as a whole person, not just those identities, but as a professor, as a friend, as a, as a parent. Um, so I know lots of things about Diana. So that helps me see Diana, not just as respect to certain identities, but her and her entirety. So the more we know and can see people as their, as their whole selves, um, the less inclined we are to use stereotypes to, um, to really be the source of our, our, our shifting our, our interactions with others. Yeah. And Diana, you can share the others. So um, as we mentioned before, with the many examples of the origins of implicit bias, uh, biases are learned. So if that's true, they can also be unlearned. So um, these are some ideas on how you can unlearn those biases. For example, exposing yourself to more diverse media, um, sort of questioning and being critical of what shows you watch and making sure that the diverse spectrum of human experiences is, um, is, is represented. Uh, you can also uh, watch some TED videos that, uh, that, that have similar messaging, the danger of a single story, which argues that um, we should um, not base our impressions on a whole group, on uh, a single person, um, and stumbling towards a more just world by our very own uh, Dr. Julie Garcia is a great TEDx talk as well. We should also expose ourselves to more diverse images, um, and diversify our social networks. Because if we wanna see people as their whole person, we have to get to know their whole person. Uh, so that means interacting with uh, people of different out groups and doing so more than just once, right? So having frequent quality uh, contact. Um, and that's because a lot of research suggests that the more contact you have, uh, the less bias you toward, have towards those groups. Um, and Another point, though, is you shouldn't ask if you have friends, if you try to diversify your network and you're interacting with people from marginalized groups, you don't you should not rely on them to teach you how to be an anti-racist. Um, it's not their job to, to teach you how to how to act or how to change these views. Um, in addition, you should listen to their stories without judgment, um, without saying, I don't that didn't sound like a microaggression to me or are denying their experiences of, say, discrimination, for example. And finally, as a social psychologist, we realize how much of our context influences our behavior. And one of those contexts that makes your biases more likely to leak is when you are in a rush, right? Which happens all the time at work. So I feel like that's super relevant to all of you. Um, maybe you're under a strict deadline. Uh, you're in a rush because you have to go get your kid from somewhere and this meeting is taking too long. Um, when that happens, uh, we are more likely to be biased when we're under that cognitive load, when we're in a rush, um, because we are more likely to categorize people based on these identities that we assume. And we're, um, when we're rushed, we're more likely to rely on our stereotypes because we don't have the time to override them or inhibit them or question them, right? And lastly, we're going to talk about a growth mindset. Carol Dweck is a social psychologist currently at Stanford, and she developed this pro mindset idea. And what she talks about is abilities broadly. We tend to put our abilities in one of two camps. Either our abilities are a product of um, learning and, and growth, what she calls a growth mindset, or they're a product of innate natural ability, what she calls a fixed mindset. And that can pertain to anything. It can pertain to athletics, you know, the natural, you know, here's someone is naturally gifted, academics, uh, anything, you know, friendliness. And we want to really think about this in, in terms of uh, engaging in more equitable practices. It, you know, Diana and I were experts in this field, but it doesn't mean that we never make mistakes. We make mistakes too. Um, 
And we could take those mistakes and say, well, I'm just, this is too hard. Um, I'm not good at this. And I'm just gonna check out and not try to do things differently in a more egalitarian way. So having a fixed mindset, we wanna encourage you to have a growth mindset. We all will mess up. Um, seeing there's a lot of research that by Margot Monteith who talks about our, um, when we mess up, seeing those mess ups as opportunities to think about, well, why did I mess up in the context? What, what were the cues in that moment? And how can I see those mistakes as opportunities to choose, do something differently in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. So we just want to remind you to have a growth approach um, when you try to engage in more egalitarian behaviors. Mm -hmm. And with that, I think we are sort of running out of our time, but we're going to open up to a Q&A very soon. We just wanted to thank you for being engaged, spending this 30 minutes with us and how, how excited we are to be here and to recognize also that this is a journey. And we're here to answer questions about that journey for you uh, and anything else that came up during uh, the talk. And here are some example books that we think would be good to continue if you want to continue on this journey uh, and like reading. Here are some great um, options as well as the TED Talks and other uh, options I provided earlier. Well, hello, hello everyone. I'm Jazz Jackson. I serve as the Chief Student Success Equity Inclusion Officer here at the university. And I want to personally thank um, both Dr. Gar Garcia and Dr. Sanchez with their uh, wonderful information in regards to bias, implicit bias, and microaggression. So um, I'm excited to be able to ask you guys some questions to dig deep in some of these items. So you guys actually mentioned, um, mentioned that an it's a normal way of how people think in regards to not understanding that they have an implicit bias. If this is a normal part of the cognition, why do you think so many people are resistant to believing that impl impl implicit bias exists? That's a good question. So if people, if it's a normal cognitive process, you know, just re let me restate the question. Why are some people reluctant to, to acknowledge that they might have implicit biases? I, I think, you know, I think there's several perhaps reasons for that. I think perhaps one is like what Diana was mentioning early, earlier about um, hearing, uh, hearing people's stories and understanding their own experiences. So sometimes I think um, you might not be aware of how biases affect you. Uh, and if you feel like you're immune to biases generally, then you might think that they don't exist for others. So I think that might be one reason that there, people might be um, reluctant um, to think about biases, this idea that um, if we think about success, failures, achievements as um, sometimes driven by our, our biases, one might think, well, you know, I, I work hard, I get what I get from my efforts, so biases just don't exist. And if they do exist, then you can just work hard and push through. Mm -hmm. um, so I think some of our, you know, um, individualistic frameworks of how we might approach and think about things might be at the heart of some of that. What do you think, Diana? Well, I would just add that I'm not sure everybody has learned about implicit biases in such a way that they realize that it is a normal process to, um, for that people tend to, most people tend to be implicitly biased. And I think there's a common association that implicit, if you have implicit bias or you recognize implicit bias and you're saying everyone's racist, right? Which they tried to say those are distinct things, but I think that people hear bias, they think, well, this person's, then I'm a racist. And that's an uncomfortable uh, thing for many people. And it's not a socially desirable thing. So I think it's also a pushback against those labels. And implicit biases operate under the veil, right? You can't actually see them. So if you can't see them, then people, uh, you know, um, don't believe they exist. And if, but they, if they were observing things carefully, like the ways that I mentioned, nonverbal behaviors, the differential outcomes that say African-American and white job applicants have when they try to apply for jobs, they look at the actual evidence, then they would see the evidence of, uh, of how these things are working. So that's, that's it. Yeah. Perfect. Great Thank question. you guys. Thank you guys for that wonderful response. And so one of the things that I want you guys to dig a little bit deep in, you guys provided uh, multiple visual aids and videos. And so what advice do you have for people who frequently experience microaggression? Mm. Well, I think there's, I mean, sometimes you just want to know, you know, there's sometimes gaslighting this, this experience that if you experience uh, microaggressions, you feel like no one believes that they're true. So sometimes it's just, 
helpful when I've experienced microaggressions to to talk about with a friend like that, like, can you believe this happened? And mm -hmm. someone who believes you, you know, like, oh, I right. totally get it. Uh, this has happened to me. So sometimes it's just helpful to just, I think, first feel heard and to, you know, so someone's going to to hear your reality and not say, mm -hmm. you know, you're overreacting. They were just making a joke. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it just helps to be with the emotions, I think. Sometimes mm -hmm. that, that's the first step. What do you think, yeah. Diana? I agree that social support is huge. Um, recently, I was at a chair function. I'm now the chair of the psych department. And I remember one of the first comments is like a very male space. Very few women occupy these positions, even at Rutgers University. And one of the former chairs was there and was like, wow, you, you look so young, too young to be a chair. And at, on the surface, this seems positive, right? He's saying, I look young. I should be happy about that. Um, but what it sent to me was, I don't belong here. I don't look the part here. And that there's an age requirement here. None of which are true, I hope. <laughs> um, but and, I'm, and the first thing I did, because I was a little thrown, was to mosey on over to a female who was in the room and I shared my experience. So I was just processing it out loud. It happens sometimes. And she immediately understood. And that was very validating for me that. Um, so I think that's a great example. And then something I had meant to say is that with these microaggressions, like the one I just said, right, the intent there was a compliment. I, I get that that was the intent. Um, but as we said in the beginning, there's a difference between like the intent and the outcome of those events. So um, I think that as a person who's receiving this, you have to recognize both things, I think, that there was an intent there that might have been positive, that it went awry, and it's okay that I feel painful, I have, I feel something about it. And if I am feeling brave that day, I might also step up and confront uh, the experience or bring to light how this conversation or this microaggression could be interpreted by various people. So I do a lot of work on confronting prejudice. And um, so I, I wasn't feeling brave in that moment because it was my first day as chair. But I, that is another op, like a way of coping with experiences of discrimination or microaggression. So that, I just wanted to add that. So, so you bring up a great, a great area in regards to educating other people in regards to the microaggression. Doesn't that become exhausting? And how do you <laughs> overcome the, 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 the right. constant urge to educate when it should be your job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts, but do you want to go first, Julie? <laughs> sure. I, well, I think, you know, two things. I, I feel like, you know, there's been moments where, you know, I engage because I feel like I feel distressed by not engaging at all. Like this, especially if someone that is, I'm going to be working with. Um, so for example, uh, it was my first or second year at Cal Poly. This person isn't there anymore. So you, you, if you want to look up our, my, the professors in my department, I say, which one is it? Their person isn't there anymore. Um, but we were in a small meeting and we were talking about our students who were going on to graduate school. And uh, there was a white student who got, didn't get into any PhD programs and a black student who did. And immediately she, this is a white woman says, you know, this is clearly an example of, um, of, 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 of racism, you know, of, of um, well, you know, white racism, you know, mm -hmm. so that, you know, so clearly this white, this white woman should have gotten in as black woman didn't deserve to get into future programs. Mm -hmm. And I was floored and I didn't say anything in the moment because I did, I wasn't expected. I didn't know what to say. And this was, I was junior. This is a full professor, uh, which I wasn't even tenured yet. And and I sat with it, sat with it. And I'm like, I need to tell her. I need to talk to her. And I told her, you know, you're making a lot of assumptions. I eventually went to her office. It was just she and I didn't confront with a whole bunch of people. And I said, you know, this is an example of why, you know, here's like why I think this is flawed logic. You don't know where they were applying. And, you know, just to assume that this African-American woman didn't get in because it got in because of her race. That's why women got, didn't get in because of her race is problematic. So many levels. And this is why people like me have to work so hard <laughs> to prove that we're here. This mm -hmm. is part of my lived experience too. Mm -hmm. um and she told me why she wasn't racist and uh I don't know how much my white you know me talking to her about it changed her opinions or beliefs about herself because she told me all the ways in which she was not biased but for me I left feeling like well at least I had a discussion mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. there's someone I had to had to work with so yes it's, mm -hmm. it can be daunting it can be daunting to sit with it so sometimes I just sometimes depending on the moment if, if I feel like not safe either because I think someone might Physically aggressed against me, yeah. You know, physically or in other ways retaliate, I don't. Um, 
and sometimes when I feel like I, I, I have to just for my own, you know, working relationship, I, I do. So I, I think, it, you know, confronting can be, there's not like one way to do it, you know, alone mm -hmm. or in a group or always. I think there's so many factors that play into when and why. And definitely if you feel, you know, you've, you're tapped out, I think that's totally fine to, mm -hmm. to do that. And <laughs> self-care is important. Yeah. So it is exhausting. That's right. And cause just think about how much time Julie had to spend ruminating about what to do about that situation and preparing for it and walking up to that room. There's a lot of exhaustion in there. Um, but uh, there is some empowerment there when you have an opportunity to step to speak up. But when I do this work, I try to make the point of, well, yes, it can give you a sense of an autonomy as a minority person to confront uh, discrimination, but it shouldn't be, the burden should not be placed on the minority individuals in the room, the people who are targets of prejudice or, um, or the particular person who is targeted with prejudice, that it's our responsibility and as witnesses to this, to speak to all, to step up, um, especially if you're in a high status situation and you're protected from some of that retaliation that you, um, that majority group members and people who are not the targets of those prejudices should be a part, should be allies in the situation and um, confront uh, those situations. So that's all I would add to that. Agreed. Thank you guys so much for sharing. So our next question essentially says, how would you characterize the relationship if there is one between implicit bias and white privilege? Hmm. To, to me, I, I saw that question. And to me, it, it seems as though there's a connection between um, whether our identities are privileged and whether or not we're biased. And I feel, I, I mean, I feel like, you know, as Diana mentioned with social identities, we all have different multiple identities. And our identities are sometimes, um, you know, they're, we're in a position of, of, of privilege and we're not in a position of privilege and we all hold these biases. So even though I'm not white, for example, um, Mexican American, Latina, it doesn't mean that I don't hold implicit biases based on race or based on mm -hmm. other groups. So I, I would say we're not, that no one group has all the share of implicit biases. We can all manifest them in different, in different ways. And I think that's why, you know, I, when I teach or do trainings about this, why I like to start with implicit bias is that we can think about implicit bias as, as Diane's mentioned is, um, I'm not evil or bad if I have biases because we all are susceptible to these message, right? About what, who is smart, who is capable, who is moral, who is right. And we all hear those messages regardless of our identity. So sometimes that ekes out, even with Diana's example with the, um, preschool students, even African American teachers, express those biases of you know looking at the black boy more. Um, so you can be even our own group. So um, yeah. I, I think we all can have those so those biases, and it can eke out in different ways. What about yeah. you, Diana? Yeah, I was just thinking the same thing that um, implicit biases are part of what create the white privilege uh, and. People and then also, if you're talking about people who who are aware of their own white privilege, that those who are aware of their own white privilege might still hold implicit biases because of the cultural associations that exist. But they may be the ones who are those who are aware that might be most likely to work and do do the work to try to change their implicit biases in the ways that we suggested on that last slide. Yeah. Thank you so much. So we talked about the people who frequently experience microaggression. So I want to flip that question over. What advice do you have for those in individuals that actually inflict microaggression mm. towards people? What do you have for them? What, what insights do you have for them? Mm. So that's a great question. And I would say the field has mostly focused on identifying, defining what a microaggression is and the consequences of it for targets of, of microaggressions. So the field is catching up on how to identify what motivates these microaggressions. It might be these implicit biases, but I guess I would just um, be, I think the first step is coming to a talk like this, <laughs> finding out um, what microaggressions are, being honest with yourself about maybe the times in which you have unknowingly engaged in a, a microaggression. Um, 
and being careful of our compliments when they're direct, when they're associated with these social categories in any way. Cause I think that's a cue that perhaps there's a stereotype that's motivating your um, behavior. And that might be painful, even if it's seemingly positive uh, on the surface. So just that intent and knowing our intent isn't always associated with positive outcome. But what do you, what do you have to say about that, Julie? I, I agree. And I like the idea with the, the, uh, guidelines you provided about is it based on social identity and maybe pause like for the example you provided about um I mean you're so young to be chair would you have said that if you're a guy man would you have said that if the question like where are you from are you just as interested in where white people come from or just people of color mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. then maybe you know it's only people of color really interested in where they're from because they're not from here right mm -hmm. so I think that's kind of that's a I think a great cue about why I'm asking those things and mm -hmm. you know with what is it really, when I ask these questions, is, am I really trying to get to know someone or is I'm trying to get something out of them? So to give you an example, there's another microaggression. So I was uh, a friend, you know, kind of acquaintance really, um, asked me out to lunch because um, she wanted to get my perspective. And it turns out during lunch, I, find, I discover um, that she wants to do creative writing and wants to write about lesbians and her story. So wants to learn about my experience to write about some of that. And I was like, you know, first of all, I was writing, you should tell what you know. And I felt really like, I'm not gonna tell you my life story or some personal stories that can end up in some book. I just felt like it was very, you know, I want something from you rather than getting to know you. And often I think we want something really quick, I think, and getting mm -hmm. to know you. Like I was at a party and, uh, you know, someone I didn't know was asking about like, how did you have your child? How did you, I was like, whoa, whoa, you know, we're having drinks, we're at a New Year's Eve party. I don't know you, buddy. I'm like, these are really kind of personal questions. Like, because mm -hmm. you're from a different background, you feel like you need to know someone's personal story when you don't, when you've never really engaged before, mm -hmm. is, is I think off putting. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's ways in which we can learn, you can learn from others and diversify your network. But if that's like the first question, um, and I can understand someone's eagerness to maybe know or learn, but it's just not, it doesn't come off as genuine and it's very much one sided, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we got we got another question that came in. What role do you guys think edu the education system should play in addressing implicit bias? Mm. That's a that's a great question. I feel I well. Uh, this is me speaking my truth, <laughs> so I'll preface with that. But I've been a part of a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in the educational system. And I think what I've seen that seems to be effective is diversifying our educators, right? The faculty members in our classes, the people who are in your cases creating course content, maybe um, you want to diversify the people who are imparting knowledge. Um, you also want to um, provide a context that's a norm of egalitarianism as much as you can, um, where prejudice doesn't have a place here. Um, so you can foster a sense of belonging among uh, students of diverse backgrounds. I think that that institution should be, should be explicit about that. And I think that they're moving in that direction. Um, and paying it, I think people should also do a deep dive in examining the data they have to figure out where their gaps are, right? So you look at how, you know, are there racial disparities in, in completion times in my educational system? Are we having our students of color paying more than our other students? Because And is there some flaw in the system that we can address? So I think we, we just need to put in the effort to understand what, where the gaps are in our educational system. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's great. It, you know, getting data, uh, you know, where where there might be differences based on social identities is a great starting point. And as you said, I think particularly in the curriculum, there's so many opportunities. There's one of my favorite um, articles by a friend of mine, um, thinking she could be the next president um, by Desi Rios, and it, it, it's the same class, a political side class. And they they all they had is more female exemplars intentionally in one class versus the other, mm -hmm. and when they had more female exemplars, same content is the same, it's the same, just different, more female exemplars. Women said that they could see themselves in, in political office more with mm -hmm. exemplars. So just being really mm -hmm. cognizant of our delivery, our approach, mm -hmm. um, books we use, exemplars we use, if, if we think mm -hmm. about from the curriculum, curricular aspect can really make a big difference. It doesn't, and that's not too onerous, just to be mindful of 
examples I provide. You don't have to redo the whole curriculum, but just exemplars would, would create meaningful difference for other people because they can see yeah. themselves. Yeah. So, yeah, we did something similar in a classroom once that um, had the syllabi had more diverse related um, information, diverse content, and actually helped both all the students in that condition compared to another condition where there wasn't that content. Sorry, Jazz. <laughs> no, I, no, I appreciate your additional ad. Um, we're getting pushed at time. So yeah. my essential final question for you guys is, if you can think about one thing you want our audience to take away, what would it be? Mm. Do we each get one? Yeah. <laughs> go for it, Dana. <laughs> do it, do it, and I'll go. Um, okay, implicit biases are real and I can do something about them. That would be. And that was two, maybe. <laughs> What's yours? Yeah, I know. I, I I love that. And I think, you know, we think Diane and I were talking before about um, what we can think, you know, for all the ways, the, the um, strategies, which one would probably be the one to maybe do most or be more effective. And that's the um, really diversifying your network. Because it helps so many of the other strategies. If I if I have more contact with people from um, a group, and not just one person but many, then that allows me not to hold a stereotype about one group. I can see how my stereotype is not going to be valid. Um, I can see the whole person. It just it helps in so many different yeah. ways. I can have more empathy for experience, and that it, that helps with perspective taking to believe someone's story is different from my own. So there's so many ways in which contact can have a positive effect. Yeah. Um, Thank you guys for attending and we look forward to seeing everyone at our future events. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you guys.